So I'm here to talk about uh, my work with um, the Deep Winter Greenhouse Project, we're calling it. I, uh, I work at the Center for Sustainable Building Research, um, but um, this work has basically been headed up by uh, the U of M Extension. And just for anybody that doesn't know, um, because the U of M is a land grant university, um, part of their obligation really is to help share the knowledge that um, we, you know, come up with <laughs> at the university. Um, and so that's done through basically the extension service. It acts as kind of the, the intermediary between, you know, the rest of Minnesota and the university. Um, so it goes both ways. Um, and so um, they have a portion of, of their program called the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. It's called regional because the state is roughly broken up into five di different areas. Um, rural areas, this is outside the metro. There's no RSVP within the metro. Um, but uh, basically, again, that's, it's that kind of interface. Um, but uh, it really provides um, kind of a, a resource base and sometimes a funding mechanism um, for different projects, um, communities, uh, you know, for organizations and so forth to um, connect, you know, to university resources. Um, and so, um, you know, really recognizing that we're kind of all in this together and um, hopefully learning from each other. So, um, it, you know, a big reason for the work that we've done, we're in this, this greenhouse work, is recognition that, you know, the, our current food system is obviously <coughs> pretty broken, or it seems to be working, but we're propping it up with a lot of stuff. So, um, you know, obviously we've got some concerns about <laughs> Um, how much fossil fuel energy we're using, and um, really about uh, kind of our food security issues. Um, and so a big push with this work is to try and increase our, our local reliance um, and local food production. Obviously, we get a lot of stuff from California, the Central Valley, and uh, especially during the winter time. And so our aim is to really um, try and get that sweet spot. Minnesota. Great place to grow in the summertime. Pretty good place to grow in the spring and fall, you know, especially if you've got hoop houses or some kind of season extension. But of course, there's the winter months, which <laughs> go on and on and on and on. So that's really what this project is trying to hit. Um, you know, and of course, there's all kinds of water issues and so forth. Fortunately, we're blessed here in Minnesota. Of course, um, even within Minnesota, there's lack of really good kind of regional food um, access. And so, you know, this is addressing really many different prongs um, related to really holistic sustainability. Um, so the way that I look at my, you know, contributions and portion of the, of the project is really about high performance greenhouse design. Um, my background is in architecture. Um, and as Doug mentioned, I work at the Center for Sustainable Building Research and uh, Really, a lot of my work there has been um, communicating aspects of high performance building design. And so um, part of that um, was doing some teaching at the U, as Doug mentioned. And uh, we did um, a series of net zero design studios and partnered with Habitat for Humanity um, to design net zero energy houses um, for them. And so this is a house that was um, designed by our students and uh, was built in North Minneapolis. Um, very, I mean, it works, but it's a very unique home. I mean, we really made use of the resources that were available to Habitat, which was a lot of extruded polystyrene insulation and free labor, essentially. So I would not recommend taking this exact approach that we used um, for your net zero home. But um, point being, you know, this is kind of the one extreme end of the spectrum as far as enclosure, if that makes sense, right? Um, that's real, obviously, and in this particular case, you know, if you added up all the donated hours and donated materials and so forth, relatively expensive. Um, as far as design drivers, you know, this is designed primarily for human comfort, right? I mean, that's why we build houses, to maintain a consistent environment that we, you know, like to be in, whether that's temperature or humidity. And, you know, along with that, of course, is indoor air concerns and so forth. So really making sure that this is designed to you know, have good ventilation and you know, environmentally um, inert materials. Um, you know, Year-round use at relatively constant temperature. You know, if you're doing some natural ventilation in the summer, 
Um, this utilizes both passive and active solar. Um, so doing some passive solar in the southern orientation of the windows. Uh, we've got some solar thermal on the top of the house. And then there's a large, I think it's a 4.3 kilowatt um, system on the garage in the back. And it's put back there because there was this tree on the boulevard that we had to you know, basically move our array back to get out of the shade. There's some storage in the domestic hot water, right? You know, this obviously goes down and preheats uh, um, mass of water in the hot water heater. And uh, insane amounts of insulation. This has uh, about a foot of extruded polystyrene on the exterior continuous. I mean, again, not something I would recommend doing for every house. Um, uh, but it is designed to be essentially net zero. On the other end of the enclosure spectrum, we might say is the hoop house, right? This is really, you know, maybe two layers of six mil polyethylene, <laughs> you know, um, but basically just designed to moderate extremes in, you know, ambient temperature, right? And maybe capture a little bit of solar gain in there. Designed obviously to keep the plants alive, more or less. Designed for season extension, right, in a couple seasons. Um, utilizing passive solar gain and some supplementary heating typically. Um, there's no heat storage in this and really no insulation unless you count, you know, the airspace between the two layers of poly, you know, still it's pretty marginal. You're even inflating it with outdoor air, so um, kind of minimal. So somewhere in the middle there is where I think this project sits, right? It's com combining, you know, the enclosure for plants with High performance building, right? Um, at you know modest cost, essentially designed for plant comfort and human health. Winter use, which obviously here in Minnesota is pretty demanding, um, using pass passive and active solar systems. Some storage and thermal mass. I'll get into these details as we move along. Sensible amounts of insulation. Um, you know, I, it, this is the caveat about you know like using appropriate technology for the the application and. And, uh, you know, using insulation that makes sense. We're not going overboard. As you all know, there is a trade off, you know, in how much insulation you put in. You know, it makes sense up to a point, and then after that, you're just really throwing money at very little energy that you're ultimately saving. Um, and uh, really, the goal with this um, is to minimize our supplemental heating fuel usage. Obviously, anybody could grow in the middle, in winter, in the middle of winter in Minnesota if they threw enough heat at it, right? And typically we do that by burning fossil fuels. So, you know, yeah, of course you can do that. It is an option. We're trying to avoid that. <laughs> um, so the definition of people in a greenhouse, as you know, um, pertains to this project, really has to do with two things. One is we're optimizing production for the winter, right? We're not trying to do year-round production in this greenhouse. That's a really important fact because it will not perform well year-round. Okay, use it for something else. Dehydrated it or something. Um, and the other aspect is that we're using thermal mass for heat storage, right? I'll get into that. A um, little bit of history. Uh, there was um, a couple of growers locally. Um, this is really kind of kick-started by um, a couple out of Island, Minnesota, um, seeking to minimize their heating costs um, using passive solar gain, um, using you know accessible construction techniques, not something fancy. Or you know some proprietary system like SIPs and spray foam and all that kind of stuff. Really trying to keep it, you know, buildable by typical, you know, grower, or farmer, or whatever. Um, and really, it was trying to realize like what crops will grow well in this type of environment that we can actually get here, right? And so that typically, um, you know, up to this point has been really like cool season greens, you know, Asian greens, kale, that sort of. Thing. That's really kind of where we're, we're continuing to push it. You know, we'll see in the next go around um, where we can take that. But I'll get into that a little bit more too. Um, and so this couple, um, Carol Ford and Chuck Weibel, uh, built their greenhouse and um, wrote the Northlands Winter Greenhouse Manual. How many people have you seen this before? A couple people. Cool. Um, and uh, it really kind of, um, yeah, it really just started the fuse of. Um, renewed interest in this type of structure. Um, 
I think, you know, if it was kind of, you know, this was uh, written in 2001, I believe, or 2003. But really, you know, it was when I think, you know, people started to recognize, you know, our fuel systems and our economic systems are not quite as, you know, uh, <laughs> um, impervious as one might think, right? Um, and so, I think you know people will start to again really more at self-reliance or regional reliance, um, and so the movement spread, and a lot of people started building um, these kinds of structures. And so this is a map I've put together of really all of the deep winter greenhouses, and again by that I mean optimizing for winter and using uh, thermal mass storage. Um, and really they're kind of all over the state. A couple in Wisconsin, one out here in South Dakota. I'm sure this is not you know, the entire list. If anybody knows of any other ones, please tell me. <laughs> I'd love to continue adding to this, this map. Um, but just to give you some idea of like what's out there already, right? Question? Are these, are these deep green houses that are secure, those have an input of power that is uh, also fuels, or are they actual, actually just solar thermal? They're all passive solar. I'll get into a little bit of the, like, you know, the energy balance stuff in just a bit, but yes. Every single one of these is going to have supplementary heating of some sort. You know, a couple days, you know, you know what it's like in February in Minnesota. We get a week of cloudy weather, you know, that drains down your heat battery real quick. And so, you know, and it only takes one night to kill all your plants. So we need some kind of supplementary heat. Typically that's propane for a similar delivery fuel. Yep. Um, so that was kind of the most recent history. Looking a little bit farther back, um, there, was, there was a 1994 FAO report talking about um, Chinese solar greenhouses. And this is really where I see the technology having started, really. 1930s, China, um, you know, looking at feeding a growing population, even at that point. And so they basically, um, you know, had, had glass really over a pretty large structure and then some uh, basically bricks and masonry for um, thermal mass and uh, they had you know clay drain tile essentially underneath um, the growing area that would circulate the warm air through there. Um, of course in the 60s and 70s you know plastic film started being used so there was another kind of boost in the number of, of um, um, structures that were being constructed in China. Um, and then the coal shortage in the 80s um, continued to, to boost that up. And so literally there are thousands of acres under glass or plastic um, in, throughout China. Um, and so there's you know, some pretty heavy duty studies talking about you know, design variations, but this is typically what it was. Um, you know, a, a masonry or you know, in this case, clay brick wall with leaves or straw for insulation, very low tech, you know, making use of local resources Something that could literally be constructed um, by you know, with local materials, literally on site, um, say for maybe the, the film, right? And you notice some clay tiling underneath here. Um, so this is basically what the design looks like. Um, you know, nice long extrusions, and uh, often some kind of you know multiple layer system that can be deployed by the operator um, to help control the environment. Um, and just to go around the states a little bit, I mean, this, ob this, this movement obviously is not isolated to Minnesota. Um, this is uh, in Nebraska. This guy, and I'm blanking on his name right now, but he's, he's written a book called Oranges in the Snow. Um, and very interesting guy, kind of a self-taught uh, engineer. But this is his greenhouse attached to his house. He uses some basically geothermal ducting um, that helps you know, moderate the temperature. Um, and uh, it's sunk down a little bit, so you know I think his actual growing area is some three feet below the outside soil. So kind of a cool project. This is you know way back, 26 years ago now. Um, 99, Lake City, Minnesota. Um, this is down at Earth and Path Farm. Um, this is, was partially funded by a SARE grant, but you know very large structure as you can tell. A little bit of PV up on here for um, running the fans and so forth. Um, this is Chuck and Carol's project. Um, some other, you know, here's um, a community in BC. Uh, they've got, you know, cisterns buried down under here for capturing rainwater off the structure. 
They've got solar thermal and PV up on top. And this is very interesting because they're kind of doing a, a dual heating strategy here. So not only are they getting the passive solar gain through the glazing here, but then they're also, they've got a concrete floor and they're basically doing hydronic radiant heating with the solar heated water or you know, glycol solution that goes through the panels and then they're running that through the, uh, the floor. So kind of a, a, a backup in their thermal mass. Um, Blacksburg, Virginia, um, you know, pretty straightforward. Boulder, Colorado, I throw this one in there because this is kind of more towards the high performance end of the spectrum. This was a, okay, I, th this one, vertical glazing, um, all double glazed, all automated. There are shutters, basically, that fold back up against uh, the interior roof here, and then they close at night for insulation, um, you know, boy, basically whenever the sun isn't shining. And then down here, there's uh, basically sliding shutters that slip up inside of this green area and then go down to insulate at night. Fully, you know, fully deployable. Um, it's all built with uh, SIPs, you know, the sandwich panels of basically styrofoam and OSB. Um, anybody want to take a guess at how much this one costs? It was for research, to be clear. It was nicely monitored. And 220,000. Keep going. 500,000. Almost 400,000. Yep, yep. So, trying to, you know, scale it back a little bit. You know, I can recognize there's definite value to this, you know, and even looking at local projects, you know, SIPs have a lot to offer. You know, they're, they're really good at keeping the heating, right? Yeah. You talk about SIPs a little bit. SIPs, um, so you can kind of see in profile here, um, it's essentially, uh, they call it a stress skin panel sometimes. And not to diverge too much, but it's basically OSB, OSB, and then a sandwich with um, styrofoam, just regular uh, expanded polystyrene in the middle. And this is used more and more frequently as a, a building material for residents. Um, they kind of, you know, ride off the channels and they'll do uh, like tongue and groove kind of joinery. Um, but basically, you've got continuous styrofoam insulation throughout the entire envelope of your entire house. It's laminated together, you know, basically glued together with the, the, the OSB. And, you know, it basically acts as kind of like a big wide flat I beam. That's where you get your structure. There's no studs in it whatsoever. They route out some, you know, utility channels if you want to run electrical or whatever in there. Um, but, um, you know, it, they're kind of spendy. But if it's put together right, you know, very good, nice and tight, and obviously, you know, continuous insulation. So, really good. Um, so, as far as like how I got into this, um, in 2013, the, Renew the Renewable Sustainable Development Partnerships hired us to work with um, a environmental learning center um, called Eagle Bluff down near Lanesboro, Minnesota. As some of you may know Joe Deaton, the director down there. Very, you know, astute and, uh, um, you know, he, he understands systems um, very well. And so he was looking at integrating some kind of deep winter greenhouse at the uh, ELC down there. Um, so we put together this manual as part of that, and I, for, I mistakenly forgot to bring um, one of these along with me, or a couple, I mean, extension prints them, and you know, they're provided for free. They're also available for download, you know, free PDF download from their website, if anybody wants to check that out. Um, but it's really kind of a survey of all the different kind of season extension and growing operations um, in Minnesota. Um, and, you know, it's really, it looks at the different approaches, um, what kind of things you need to keep in mind. Um, and, you know, really, um, it's not specifically focused on the deep winter greenhouse, I'll say that, right? This is kind of a broader spectrum. And the other thing is there's, you know, many different kinds of crops grown in greenhouses that um, are in this book, but still um, very good resource. So that was back, you know, three years ago. And as part of that, we did a prototype design for Eagle Bluff. Um, shown here. Um, ultimately, they wanted a larger structure, and so that went into another design phase. And I think they're actually fundraising now for what I, I believe is like a $1.7 million greenhouse. It's a teaching greenhouse. It'll have an NSF certified processing kitchen. It's got, you know, it's, it's since it's a school, they have to be ADA compliant and sprinklered, and, you know, there's going to be an elevator, and, you know, I, it's, yeah, so it's, it's not just a greenhouse. Okay. Um, but, uh, so then <laughs> we um, got hired to basically, or we got a grant rather, um, to develop uh, a prototype 
based, you know, kind of scaling back these issues. Um, and the initial questions that I had going into this uh, were really how do we optimize heat gain in the deep winter? How do we retain that heat once we get it? And how do we improve the construction details? And I'll get into why this is such a big deal in a bit. Um, so first one, heat capture or heat gain. Um, really, the things that we're coming up with, you know, there are all kinds of glazing angles and different strategies about you know, why we have glazing on one wall or the other, or do we do it on the end walls, blah, 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 blah. Really, I scaled everything back to basic passive solar design principles. You know, that is, solar heat gain is best when the rays come in perpendicular to the glazing. And for that reason, you know, this is tailored for the deep winter, essentially, right? Which uh, means that this glazing wall is basically at 60 degrees, right? 60 degrees is optimized for November and January. Notice that like December 21st, obviously our shortest day of the year, but not typically our coldest. Our coldest day is usually January 20th, or right around there, okay? Just because of the lag, the seasons and you know the plan and so forth. And so it's really you know optimized for, for that period. But really we're trying to capture that November through February, March period, right? Um, the other nice thing, kind of a, a, a side benefit of having a steep angle, is that we're dumping more snow. Obviously, you know, as you may see with the solar panels out in front here, right? You know, nice mellow angle, which is great for an awning, but snow is going to collect there pretty well, you know. Um, and so the steep angle is going to shed any snow, allowing, of course, more sunlight to get in, and then we don't need to worry about structural damage from snow load if we get a nice big wet snow or something. Um, the other side benefit of that is that uh, because we don't need to carry snow load, um, all we're really worried about is uh, supporting the glazing material and a little bit of wind load, right? Um, so we can get by with less framing, which means even more light can get in to the plants inside and ostensibly heat. Um, you know, slightly um, in the in the summertime when there would be a high likelihood of this really overheating. You know, if, again, like I said, we're not trying to grow in there in the summertime, but depending on what kind of use you're looking at, it could help having, you know, with that steep angle, have actually reflecting the heat gain. So um, that's basically what it comes down to, 60 degrees glazing. And how do we retain the heat? Um, so really, that's uh, looking at a couple different things. One is heat storage, right? And that's the thermal mass, which I'll get into in just a little bit. Um, and then how do we move the heat to and from that thermal mass? And then of course, uh, retaining that heat, right? And so like in the envelope, the thermal envelope of the building, insulating really well. And again, these are just basic high performance building, you know, standards, like the two things in Minnesota that we need to pay attention to, right? insulation and air sealing, you know, like you can have all the insulation in the world, but you know, if you get drafts, it's all for now. Right? So we need to keep it tight. Um, so as far as heat storage, uh, this is not a new concept, obviously. Thermal mass for heat storage has been around for literally <laughs> millennia. Um, as far as uh, usage in a greenhouse or something, that also has been you know, used uh, for a long time. Um, and interestingly, the, you know, we kind of dig into this and you, you know, see what people are doing around the country. All these people came up with different terms, you know, kind of independently. And so I'm sure there's even more names for it, but these are basically essentially um, talking about the same thing, which is keeping solar heat somehow in some kind of thermal mass underground, right? Or kind of a geothermal concept of sort, right? Um, and that's basically what we're doing here. This is our thermal mass. Um, I've got you know a couple photos here of uh, Chuck and Carol's project just because it's well documented and it's small, so it's relatively accessible. Um, and uh, it's basically a big rock bed. We're using an inch and a half washed river rock um, so that it gets plenty of air airflow through it. Um, and also the diameter is, is the right size. It's not too small that it saturates with heat right away. Um, and it's not so big that heat doesn't actually make it all the way into charge up the rocks, right? So basically inch and a half 
is more or less the optimal size to allow for heat transfer back and forth, right? Um, some people ask, you know, like, oh, I've seen greenhouse designs where they've got, you know, barrels of water or, you know, some other kind of water storage device. Um, and not to knock that at all, water is a fantastic thermal mass. It's, you know, it's better than rock. It's, you know, second only to ammonia, right? But um, it, the, the issue with water is that typically, you know, you've got some kind of either circulation system if you're charging something else up, more tubing, more opportunity for leaks, more pumps, everything. And uh, it typically, like if it's in your greenhouse, it's going to take up space, right? We, we're trying to make as small a productive area as possible. So really, we want to make that production area. We don't want to be taking up space with you know, a big wall of 55-gallon drums or something like that. So putting it underground, using rocks. Rocks are cheap. Air is cheap. And um, you know, really, we're trying to simplify the system as much as possible, right? So the basic premise: we're pushing air through a better box, warm air through a better box. Um, so one of the things that we came up with, um, rec looking at the existing designs, is that a lot of the projects were they basically have an intake, um, some kind of manifold, and then they would push it through um, perforated drain pile. You know, just kind of your drainage tubing, corrugated drain tile. And um, depending on the design, there was not really what would lead to good airflow through the actual rock bed, through the thermal mass, right? Really, I mean, you've, you've gone through all this effort to, you know, excavate and, you know, make below grade space and then fill it up with rocks and you're putting in duct work and everything. It's a shame to, you know, basically not utilize the whole thing, right? But in situations like this, which, you know, this is kind of a schematic of a lot of the different installations, they're drawing in hot air from the top of the peak of the greenhouse inside, forcing it down into some kind of ductwork, right, in the rock bed. And then they just have a couple, you know, tubes basically stuck in the, in the thermal mass so that the, you know, exhaust air can come out, right? Basically what that means is that there's potential, you know, dead air spaces any place where there's not, you know, one of these exits. Does that make sense? There's no incentive for the air to want to go over here and then out here. It's going to take the path of least resistance, right? So one thing that we looked at initially was really trying to optimize the heat flow, maximizing the air movement across the surface of these rocks, right? And so basically came up with a what we call a finger jointed system, and that is having supply return, you know, roughly eight inches away from each other so that, you know, basically there's incentive for that air to want to move across throughout the entire thermal mass, right? Works, you know, system makes sense, right? But um, that's a lot of duct work. <laughs> so um, for the particular prototype design that we're, we're putting forth, um, we have a slight change, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, talking with uh, a couple other people, um, realized that um, a fan placement might, might not be ideal either. So basically, of course, the main way that we're moving air through here is fans. And the way most people have done that is by putting some kind of duct fan or inline fan in the supply side, in the hot air side, right? So they're capturing that warm air up here and then they're pushing it down into the duct system of some sort, right? The thing is, that's the hottest, fluffiest, least dense air in the entire structure, right? And so you're using all this fan energy trying to push something that doesn't want to go down. And, you know, basically it's really fluffy, right? I, actually, this, this suggestion came from somebody who was a pilot. He was like, have you ever tried to fly a plane in, you know, hot thunderstorm weather? It's like, you can't grab on anything, right? You much prefer to fly in cool air your fan is going to be basically much more efficient. So putting the fan on the return side, on the coolest side, right, is going to basically maximize or make your you know, fan use more efficient. You will be using more power, but the scale is still more efficient. Um, the other thing is in the ductwork, right? Um, some people would basically be using the same diameter supply. Oops, sorry. 
um, like here, right? Um, they were capturing the hot air with the same diameter ductwork as um, what they had down here. And that fundamentally, you know, it doesn't really work with physics, right? I mean, you need, you need basically more air in supply trunks to be able to branch off of these ducts. If you only have a four inch duct supplying all of these, these aren't going to move very, very well, right? So basic HVAC design using, and I'm looking around here to see if there's any branching and ducting, not really. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the basic trunk and branch system, right? So you need a large supply. If you have a lot of smaller ducts moving to the thermal mass, you need a larger supply. Um, the other thing is, you know, this is going to reduce your resistance of airflow through the ductwork. Of course, the more friction you have in the system, the harder your fan is going to have to work and the more money you can spend for that. Um, here's another example, basically, of a manifold system. This is a big 55-gallon drum with a bunch of holes cut in it, and then they just tie all the ends of the four inch ducts into that. And um, um, so that's basically just another you know, technique to be able to see the air. But what if we could get rid of the ducts pretty much all together? You know, simplify the whole system. And so that's what we've gone through. Um, if, and again, I need to emphasize this, if you have basically sealed the top of the thermal mass, you can draw air through there, you know, basically creating a vacuum, negative pressure inside the thermal mass, not have any ducts. Basically, if this is a perforated duct right here, airflow is going to be essentially even all the way through the entire thermal mass. You know, with some slight exceptions, you know, right around the duct, right? You won't get any what's called jetting effects or anything like that. But essentially, you have got even plug or slug flow, it's called, of this air mass through the thermal mass. Does that make sense? So, we're drawing the air out on this side, we're putting the fan air on the, on the dense air side, right? And basically sucking the hot air from the peak of the greenhouse down into the thermal mass. And again, this is sealed, right? Getting rid of the ducts, right? We're getting rid of costs, we're getting rid of construction hassle. One of the notorious stories that you hear is like you're trying to bury this this plastic tubing in a bed of rocks and it keeps kind of floating its way up to the top. And so, you know, people would have to step on it while they're, you know, shoveling gravel down around their feet, you know, and then they get off and it would stay down there. But you know, all just just complications, right? So our prototype is relying on this plug or slug flow system. Um, one thing, obviously, worth bringing up uh, is about humidity and condensation. Um, you know, we're grabbing hot, you know, probably relatively humid air out of the greenhouse, bringing it down to this cool mass, right? Of course, and the moisture is going to drop out when you get the condensation. The good side of that, obviously, going through a phase change from a vapor to a liquid, we're going to get additional heat, basically, stored into the thermal mass. We get that you know, phase change benefit. It's not just the heat of the air, but also of the humidity dropping out. But you know, that means we have condensation in there. And there have been many, many questions about that, right? Um, because of potential molar micro growth. Um, you know, historically, you know, in, in residential design, looking at, at, at high performance or um, you know, some kind of uh, geo air system for residential use, it's been pretty problematic. With, you know, I've seen people that just basically can't live in their houses because there's too much mold being injected as a result of the system. Um, but there hasn't been a record of that, um, but we still need to continue studying it. To that end, we did a bunch of indoor air quality testing um, in different greenhouses. Uh, I took samples in two Minnesota um, deep winter greenhouses. Um, and I, I really want to note the difference in, in these greenhouses. So I took air samples in two Minnesota greenhouses and four Colorado greenhouses. Um, they're all you know, basically designed for winter production. Um, but uh, the Minnesota ones uh, both used a rock bed as thermal mass, and they were planting in soil on top of that thermal mass. Um, the ones in Colorado all were using soil as a thermal mass. Right? They were all still using the perforated ducts. Um, but the Minnesota ones are using a rock bed. Um, two of them were planting in soil, 
um, basically growing year round, and I'll show you some examples in a minute. Um, and two of the Colorado ones were planting in containers. The results ended up being normal micro airborne microbe activity, or counts rather. Normal for what would be basically equivalent to outside in Minnesota in the summertime. So, you know, acceptable microbe levels. Um, the two greenhouses that were planting in containers in Colorado were either normal or acceptable levels, but the ones where they were planting in soil had elevated microbe levels. Um, some, you know, ask other aspects about indoor air quality. Because the greenhouse, you know, it's not a residence. You're not sleeping in there, probably. And, you know, it's not like an office where you're in there for eight, you know, nine, ten hours a day. You're not going to get the same kind of constant exposure, right? So maybe a little less concern about um, air quality issues. Also, you have direct ventilation somehow, um, typically. Um, and the other big thing is that we're growing or we're using a rock bed thermal lens, right? And so we're specifying washed river rock. So there's essentially no organic matter for microbes to thrive, right? And um, basically nothing that can foster microbial growth um, in the extension prototype. Um, another aspect that's worth um, mentioning, uh, especially here in Minnesota, where we have radon levels of concern, um, is that uh, uh, we'll just, I, I spoke with Bill Angel, he's a um, national expert on radon, and he said, you know, basically, we'll just keep an eye on it. <laughs> he was actually more concerned about the radon in the rock bed than he was about um, you know, anything coming up on the soil. So we'll just keep an eye on it and then like if we need to. Um, heat retention, uh, how do we keep the heat in you know, once we've got it in there? Um, we're putting insulation around the thermal mass. So this is in the ground. We're dropping vertical insulation down around the perimeter of the thermal mass. Um, Obviously, insulation is the best, it's the best, most efficient, the best use when you have a big difference in temperature, when it's really cold outside and really hot inside or something like that, right? Um, for this, you know, we're going to see probably lower temperatures inside the greenhouse, probably around, you know, 40, 42, you know, dipping down to sometimes near freezing. Um, you know, if the ground temperature is typically right around, you know, 47 and 52, um, we don't need a whole lot of insulation between, you know, underneath basically our ambient ground temperature and what might be our ambient air temperature in the greenhouse. So, not the insulation underneath the thermal mass. I'm not worried, we're not worried about heat basically migrating into the ground. We're worried about it escaping out to the winter basically of the sides, right? So, again, we're just trying to reduce costs, reduce insulation problems. Um, so here's a couple examples, obviously they're insulated on the outside. And this, this one, this is at Lac Paul Valley High School um, outside of Madison, Minnesota. They use um, ICFs, basically um, insulated concrete forms. It's two layers of polystyrene and then they've got kind of a webbing that goes across there that holds it together so you can pour concrete down in there. Another way to do it. Um, the only, you know, problem with this really is that uh, you know, you're insulating the concrete here that could be potentially be a nice addition to your thermal mass. Um, and uh, you know, basically just making it easier to construct. Um, insulation above grade, right? On top, the actual structure itself. North wall and roof are the most crucial. North wall, obviously, because we're never getting any kind of solar gain from that. Um, from that side, and the roof because that's you know, heat rises, and so we're trying to keep all the heat in. Same kind of principles as we'd see in a high performance house, right? Um, so to that end, we were trying to figure out you know where um, problems are arising in the existing greenhouses. Um, so we did Bodor tests uh, on three different um, three different greenhouses. Basically, the good news was that the thermal mass was working; it was indicating that it was functioning. It was actually holding heat. Um, better than the ambient temperature. And I'm just, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna speed up a little bit here because I recognize I'm pushing up against time. Um, but the other thing that we found out was that uh, there was pretty poor air sealing on a lot of this. And like I said, we can have great insulation, but if you've got drafts, you know, again, it's all turned off. You're losing all that 
I'm sure he, he worked so hard and spent so much money on it. So one of the biggest things that came out of this was finding sealants that are compatible with polycarbonate, polycarbonate being the most prevalent uh, glazing material for the deep winter greenhouses. Not every sealant is compatible, right? And so this is a list. The ones in black here are the you know best performing. The ones in gray are pretty good. Okay. So anything on this list is suitable for um, polycarbonate. Um, the other thing, uh, so we can't really call it an energy audit, it was one kind of a performance and uh, air tightness test. Um, because none of the operators that we um, tested are actually tracking their greenhouse energy use separately. And so that's one thing that we'll be, we don't know exactly how much energy they're using for supplemental heat and fan use and all that stuff. Um, we tried to do some energy modeling um, because we couldn't get actual performance data. Um, so we use a program called Sapphira. We also tried another one called IESDE. Both of these are typically architectural um, energy modeling programs used for, for high performance buildings. But uh, they are really built for more commercial, institutional scale and style of construction. Um, so they didn't really <coughs> handle, handle the crucial design elements of the greenhouse well at all. Um, so we're working on, um, on a patch model. It's basically an HVAC uh, plug-in. And um, I'd like to do a transit model that's basically a mechanical engineering um, you know, HVAC layout. One thing that we did develop um, was a basically very fancy spreadsheet that helps calculate how much energy you potentially save. You know, basically you enter um, the dimensions of your thermal mass um, and calculate the difference in temperature between when it was ostensibly you know, discharged, 50 degrees say, and what the intake air temperature is, um, say 90 degrees. And that 40 degree difference um, taken by the actual volume of rock in there and the specific heat capacity of that rock. Basically, it comes up with you know, a, a measure of MBTUs and um, also a calculation of propane, equivalent propane, and how many dollars it would then save. Um, so again, only problem with this is that it's like ideal conditions. And um, you know, it's, it's still kind of theoretical. Um, the third question about the construction was how to improve the details. Um, really, uh, so we can answer those air sealing issues and really look at the durability of the, of the, con the, the structure. Um, minimize the dangers of condensation. We know it's going to happen, but how do we account for that? Um, how do we make sure that construction is still easy? And looking at um, healthy, durable materials. So here's you know, one of the deep winter greenhouses. There's condensation happening on polycarbonate, dropping right down on this plate, this flat plate. And Probably continuous kind of more growth, and ultimately this is going to rot out your structure, right? You know, people spend a good chunk of change on these. What a shame to have to jack the thing up and replace the sill plates. Um, and so, you know, our design tries to um, address that. Ten minutes. <laughs> um, as part of the additional research, I was able to go to Colorado and check out a, color, a couple other operations there, and I'll kind of blow through these. Um, but this one is a, um, it's, they have a perennial operation. There's fig trees in here, there's banana, there's um, you know, all kinds of exotic herbs, there's citrus. Um, um, this is at the Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute, uh, Jerome Oxentowski and Michael Taylor, I believe I want to say his name. Um, uh, there's another green high performance people in a greenhouse design uh, firm in, out of Boulder called Ceres, and they've done a number of different greenhouses. Here's the inside of one. Um, here's the intake on the back side. They've got an inline duct pan in there, and then it kind of crosses. There's another one not close to us, and it crosses underneath, and the exhaust is down there. Um, nicely constructed, nicely detailed. Um, this is another, this is at a farm I went to. This is by far the largest and most, you know, kind of beefy. Uh, greenhouse that I went to. Um, yeah, and this is literally just outside of Boulder. Um, and they're also operating a perennial operation there. Um, they've got bananas, they've got avocado, they've got, um, you know, top floor, they got citrus, uh, you know, more figs, climbing vines, uh, passion fruit. Um, really pretty amazing setup. A couple of notes about that is that they are, you know, they're still, they're, they're drawing from the peak. And they're drawing it down through metal ductwork, and then it goes underground, and then they've got it, their exhaust fans. It's like the base of the blazing wall. Um, they use a, a SIP panel, um, but it's a little bit different. This is a, 
the studs are basically contained inside the insulation, and then it's got a radiant barrier on the inside. Um, and <laughs> yeah, it's not also not a cheap installation, I'd say. And I want to show this to you guys so that I get a kick out of it. Um, this is a, a composting heating technique um, called the Jean Pen system. J E A N P A I N. He was a French guy that was super into compost and methane capture. Basically, they've got plastic tubing that runs all through this huge compost pile, and they keep it, you know, uh, anaerobically, anaerobically processing all winter long. They heat up the the water or the the solution, and it goes into this building here. And I, it's, unfortunately, it's cropped out of the photo here, but they've got a, a heat exchanger down here. The hot fluid goes through that heat exchanger, the, and there's a fan in there that blows it out. And this is their germination. They keep this at like 86 degrees constantly. And uh, it's all heated by this um, Fantastic. Um, so uh, in eight minutes, I'm going to try to get through our design. Um, Incorporated all the information that we had from the research uh, and went about time. So you saw, saw this photo. Basically, this is the most recent evolution. Here's some shots from the um, the construction document set. Um, some a couple things to note is that we've got pretty typical kind of block wall or board wall foundation with the insulation. This is extruded polystyrene, roughly R10, and on the exterior. Um, so we've got. Um, you know, again, we're basically able to use that concrete as additional thermal mass in, in, within the thermal envelope. Um, we've got the growing area down here. Um, this has no doors in it, right? All the doors go into this kind of lobby, airbox, slash packing area on the north, essentially third of the, the structure. And that's got another door here. Um, essentially, they're two separate condition spaces. Well, this one really isn't condition. Um, but again, this is for an airlock, you know, again, it's 20 below and you open the door of your heated greenhouse and you let out this here, this heat, you know, we're putting the door back here. Um, uh, essentially, we've got an intake up here, and sorry this is so watch out, but um, this is the ductwork, kind of makes a big T across the top of the, the interior of the peak of the greenhouse, goes down into that ductwork. Um, again, no ductwork in the thermal mass. It's just getting drawn through with plug flow. There's a um, concrete topping, three inch concrete topping on top of that rock bed, basically capping that ceiling so that that plug flow will work. And then there's a centrifugal fan on the exhaust side of the thermal mass that essentially is washing air. It's kind of, you know, um, diffusing the air as it comes out from the thermal mass. Um, because that is ostensibly the coolest, um, but it's also right against the glazing wall. This should help with um, air currents, keeping basically the humidity mobilized so we don't get as many condensation problems. Another thing to note here is at the base of the glazing wall, there's an angled silt plate. So any condensation we get is going to hit that and then basically drip off so we don't get standing water and again, the opportunity to move through it and rot. Um, so uh, this will be released as a full prototype document with the construction plan, the narrative, you know, basically explaining what I just explained to you guys, um, the rationale. Uh, I, we've made this standalone. We get a lot of inquiry about attaching structures to existing structures. I'd say that's a great option for a barn or an outbuilding or a garage or something like that. I would not personally attach a greenhouse to a residence. Um, generally just because there's too many areas that could go wrong with humidity. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm basically rotting your house and, you know, poisoning your air, which <laughs> I don't think anybody wants. Um, so uh, just to avoid all those problems, or, you know, making it a standalone prototype. Um, put material cost estimates together, and this was a combination of Home Depot, actual retail Home Depot prices, um, and, uh, you know, some specialty greenhouse supply stuff, um, you know, farm tech and that, and it's right around 17000 for um, material costs. Um, and the construction documents will be available for free from extension. We're just finishing up kind of disclaimer language and all that. Um, as far as building this stuff, uh, the extension, the partnership um, asked for requests for applications. We got 41 applications from different growers and organizations around the state. 
Um, and uh, we made, you know, basically we looked at their qualifications, their ability to, you know, um, finance their portion of it. We're basically going to have seats with them. Um, and their ability to host, um, you know, uh, publicity events, you know, allowing other people to come in and learn from, from what they've done there. Those sorts of things. Um, we narrowed it down to 10 finalists and we did solar assessments on all of those 10 locations around the state and we made five final selections. Just a quick note, um, part of the criteria for this, obviously we want to set the structures up for success. So we're really, you know, trying to make this, reduce any shading variables, right? And so all of the uh, five final selections are, have better than 95.8 solar access from November to March. And so we should be getting plenty of good solar gain in there. Um, we're building one this year, actually, that just saw some excavation photos um, yesterday, uh, so that's exciting. They're up in Finland, Minnesota. Um, we'll do four next year. We'll be monitoring temp and relative humidity at multiple locations inside each structure, um, and one outside, you know, is our kind of uh, test condition. We'll be measuring incoming light, um, you know, kind of a proxy for how much heat we should be capturing. Um, and then, of course, we'll be measuring, submetering all of our heating and lighting and fan use, um, and separating all that out so we know exactly what's going to supplemental heat, when we need it, if we need it, supplemental lighting. A lot of times you hear from growers that it's not really the heat that's the problem so much, it's really the length of the day. And so we might need to add some additional light you know, on either side. Um, and of course, fan energy. The only thing that makes this not a totally passive solar greenhouse is that we are circulating the medium with, with fan energy. Um, and so here are the five locations. Here's a location up in Finland. We've got one in Bemidji. Um, we've got one in Brainerd, uh, one just uh, west of Mankato, and another one um, just outside of Lake City. And so these are each in one in each of the five. Um, RFC regions. Um, next steps, what we are looking forward to doing is uh, um, we're actively seeking funding to try and you know do the version 3.0 um, and doing some more energy audits. Of course, we're monitoring all the, the other greenhouses that are going up next year um, and this fall. Um, a big one, really uh, integrating nighttime installation. So I showed you that one in Colorado, the 400,000. Again, again, we've got this heat in there. How do we keep it in, right? The thermal mass is one strategy, but the glazing wall is a big leaky sieve, you know. So we've got to keep that heat in somehow. Um, further reducing the cost, um, and that may be to materials. Uh, you know, presently it's basically two by six set frame, wood set frame with rock wall insulation. Very, very standard, you know, kind of residential, high performance residential construction. So we may um, look at going back. Looking at increasing the scale, basically, so you know growers can generate more revenue from it. Um, looking at other, the addition of other heating and lighting sources, um, whether this is something like you know an air furnace or um, you know additional solar thermal panels or then you know additional heat stuff, and then looking at more automation. Um, so we're really um, optimizing our irrigation and our ventilation and making sure that you know we're really tightening up our energy budget. So, that's it. It looks like I'm right out of time, and maybe we have a guy. Okay, all right, thank you, Doug. Um, Two questions for Paul. Is the concrete color so that it's a dark, is it a black, or do you have a blue or something on top of it so it absorbs the No, we're relying on the heat basically being charged from the thermal mass. Not that you couldn't, I'm sorry, from the air that's being circulated through there. Not that you couldn't paint something else, um, but ideally that light is going to get intercepted by the plants, right? And hopefully, you know, if the whole area is covered, that'd be ideal, you know, with plants covering all possible, you know, area that the light is coming in. Um, so I really don't know if you'd get that much from it. All the other surfaces inside the greenhouse are painted white, and that is for the benefit of the plants. It would make more sense to have them painted some dark color, but you know, it's really so that it reflects around. Yeah. Second question: Will these be monitored and tracked on the B three track? On B three? No, no. Good question, though. 
Our app is also meant to be Question I get. Yeah, so if you, can you contribute or how much of the infiltration can you No, it's a fair question. I mean, basically, we're relying on um, really tight irrigation control, so there's not a whole lot of overspray, so we're not getting a lot of excess humidity. Basically, we're tailing, tailing the water usage directly to the plants. You know what I mean? It's not going to be airborne. How much humidity from the cold air and warm air and the condensation is enough to keep the issues Right. And so, I mean, as far as durability and the structure, I mean, we know there's going to be condensation. And so basically, we're make designing details that allow that to happen, but not be a persistent problem. Does that make sense? You know, basically, at the base of the glazing wall. Um, how the interior finish in the growing room, you know, laps over the foundation so that we don't get any inflation of water, right? Um, tight air sealing is basically another reason for no penetration is that so that we're really minimizing any penetration to your barrier, um, or the vapor barrier rather, on the interior of the, the structure, right? So no utilities in the exterior walls, you know, except for in the middle, the minimizing wall, the separation wall, the water covering. Um, but yeah, you know, that, it's not that the condensation itself is a problem, it's just where it happens, right? So, um, of course, any penetration you have in your vapor barrier, that's where you're going to have a problem, right? So we're really trying to control that, making it super tight construction, avoiding those problems. Makes sense? Sure. <laughs> There's still, you know, if you seal it up, that's going to be a great... Because sometimes the penetration is bad. Mm -hmm. We will have ventilation. I mean, there's... There's ventilation, ventilating windows on it, right? And so, you know, really that's that's going to be driven primarily by heat. Um, you know, and there's maybe some concerns about humidity. We're, we'll have to see. You know, really, we're trying to minimize the excess humidity generation. And the second question is: Do you need to put it in cities or try to go to any place where you want to move it? Does it zoning stuff? No. Um, uh, a couple things. One is the the, the RCG regions are only outside. Actually, there's not one in the metro. We have funding, or we have support to be able to do one in the cities. We have yet to really figure out a partner where that's going to be. Um, there is a. I mean, they're kind of a modified winter greenhouse in South Minneapolis called Deal Gardens. They produce microgreens for some of the co-ops locally. Um, they don't do the mass, but they've got basically a single Is there one? No, Steel is Steel is right in essentially Powder Horn. I mean, they're just a couple blocks in here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just one comment I have from the state of South Technology. We're doing a, a modification of this. We've got thermal mass, but we use half of the commercial greenhouse on the side of the building. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, they would probably be opening up this space at times during the winter. Do the work. Our our greenhouse they had really little supplemental heat and not very air sealed. And on a sunny winter day, I don't know what it's made of. Yeah, uh, it's so we've got ventilation windows on both of the cable ends, right? Um, and actually, the most recent kind of input I got on that was that those should be doubled because when you want to ventilate, you want to ventilate. Yeah. yeah. Two questions also. Um, so what season, what is your non-growing season, months do you say The uh, April through, I don't know, maybe you could get in there in October, I don't know, something like that. And do you have any desires where you use the output of a condensing furnace to put water in from the outside in a growing No, I mean, we've, we've talked about different strategies to add carbon dioxide in there. Um, at this point, we're just trying to minimize the number of variables, <laughs> really, so that we're continuing the you know, proof of concept. Um, and anytime we're getting more systems in there, it, you know, basically there's more problems that arise, right? And so we're really trying to keep this as simple as possible, um, as far as the actual 
um, systems go. Um, we're counting on ventilation that, you know, our heat exhaust being able to bring in additional carbon dioxide in, in the winter months. But that's definitely an area of concern. There's, we did do some testing last winter on um, basically nutrient content of the greens that are grown in there. And while it is, it's something like 100 times higher than stuff um, because it's so fresh and stuff that we're getting from California, there was some recommendation that increased carbon dioxide levels would definitely help plant growth. That seemed to be a limiting factor. So, and whether that's a combustion. Sorry, sorry to cut it off. Let's get down here.